Uh, for our next panel, I have to say I'm personally very, very excited about. It touches an area that I cover day in and day out uh, from San Francisco. These are two of the most exciting companies in America and the world. We talk about them all the time. So we're going to hear from executives who are responsible for driving innovation at these companies uh, by using their insights into the markets and their customers. We'll hear how they take risks, focus on innovation, and their views on the future of women in business and technology. So first, I would like to introduce Peggy Johnson. She is EVP of Business Development at Microsoft. She's responsible for driving strategic partnerships and transactions to accelerate growth for Microsoft and its customers. Peggy works with external partners around the world, ranging from startups to large-scale enterprises to identify areas of collaboration, drive innovation, and unlock shared value. Now, she also manages Microsoft's relationship with the venture capital community, and she oversees strategic investments through the company's uh, corporate venture fund, Microsoft Ventures. She also serves on the board of directors for Live Nation Entertainment, Inc., and she was named by Business Insider as the number one most powerful female engineer in 2017. Please welcome Peggy Johnson. Next, we have another uh, stellar panelist. That would be Marnie Walden. She is EVP and President of Media and Telematics at Verizon. She's responsible for integrating, scaling, and growing Verizon's portfolio of new businesses and digital media, including building brand and market share for the newly announced combination of AOL and Yahoo. In case you didn't know, it's called Oath now. She's also responsible for telematics for connected cars and fleet management. In addition, she's responsible for overseeing the company's strategy development and planning group. Among her previous leadership roles, Marnie served as EVP and COO for Verizon Wireless, the largest wireless company in the United States. She oversaw the company's uh, nationwide operations and delivery of industry-leading performance for consumer and business customers. Please join me in welcoming Marnie Walden. Okay, ladies, thank you very much for being here. And full disclosure, we've been chatting away backstage and we were trying to figure out how in the world do we follow yes. that incredible <laughs> panel of athletes. So I asked them to tell me a little bit about sports exploits. And you know what? It turns out it's pretty impressive. Peggy running. Uh, yeah, not fast. <laughs> She's Just being running. modest. She says not fast, but she runs marathons. <laughs> Just a few, but not fast. <laughs> and she's, she's running the Chicago them. Marathon yeah. later this year. On October 8th, I'm running the Chicago Marathon. Looking forward to it. And Marnie, I have to get you to tell that story again because it was so good. So um, my family and I, we have a home in Breckenridge, Colorado. And there's a, um, a slalom course where you race your family members for medals. And when you get to the bottom, they quote your time against Lindsey Vaughn time. And so... Um, <laughs> I know this is live streaming, so I can't lie because somebody will say uh, that's not it. But my son is always like, oh, I'm only 10 seconds behind Lindsey Vaughn. I'm like, oh, I'm only 32 seconds behind <laughs> Lindsey Vaughn. So um, uh, I used to be a faster skier and when I was younger, but uh, that's my... Uh, it's typically the family sport that we participate in, so. That is too funny, I like it. So, okay, at least we've gotten our, our sports, our sports out, out of the way. way. Um, so we'll get down to business, and you know, chatting to you guys backstage, it's amazing because you've actually had similar career paths. Um, in a way, you both worked in the wireless world for a long time. You've gone into um, you know, leaders in technology now as well. Um, if I, I want to start, because I think this audience wants to hear how you got there. So tell me a little bit about your story, some of the challenges, how you got to where you are right now. Peggy, let's start with you. Um, well, I'm an engineer, and um, but I almost didn't become an engineer. I, there's no one ever talked to me about going into engineering. And uh, when I started at San Diego State, I was a business major. And I was just delivering mail for my job one day. And the two ladies in the engineering department who I was delivering mail to started talking to me about engineering. They were really the first people who had ever, you know, broached the subject with me. And I ended up changing my major <laughs> because of those two ladies. Wow. And going into engineering, and um, I was San Diego based, and Qualcomm is based in San Diego, the company that makes the chips that go in uh, smartphones. And I spent most of my career there. 
uh, first in engineering and then moved over into the product side and ran a, uh, a division there and, um, for 25 years and uh, eventually uh, had never answered a recruiting call in those 25 years, uh, but answered one for Microsoft because it seemed like exciting things were going on up there. So two years ago, I uh, switched over and I'm now at Microsoft. Does anyone else having a little bit of deja vu? Starting in the mailroom, our panelist Kathy from this morning also started in the mailroom. I'm thinking, you know, how times have changed. And I just wonder also if that's, you had to look for those kinds of opportunities, you know, when you were starting out years ago um, to get into what you truly wanted to do. Uh, but Marty, let's hear from you. How did, how did you get to be doing what you're doing now? Gosh, I wish I could say I was an engineer. I grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming, a town of uh, roughly 17 people. 15 of them were uh, family members. And, um, <laughs> and the other two helped on the ranch. So it was sort of a community of, in our own. Um, so when I was growing up, I either wanted to be a ballerina or a cowgirl. Those were my choices. And um, neither one of them particularly. I'm now rehearsing um, tornado drills in my head right now. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so going on. I decided I followed my sister. She went to college in California. I followed her shortly thereafter and uh, started out in, um, in finance. And not to offend all of the finance people in the, the, the room, but decided that that was not my career path. And so I ended up getting, um, I ended up being a sixth grade teacher for my first year out of college. And within probably three months on that job, I called my parents and said, I don't even like children. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I, always have, I always have to say this, that I have a child now, and I do very much care for him. Because I, one day, I think he's going to watch one of these streaming things, and he's like, you don't like children? I was like, well, I do like you, darling. Um, so I, my parents said, look, you can come back, you can work on the ranch, you can you know, do a lot of things, but you've got to get a job. And so I happened to meet somebody who knew Craig McCaw um, at McCaw Communications, and I ended up getting a, a very entry-level job. It wasn't in the mailroom, but I um, was selling phones and um, doing service. Phones out of a briefcase. I read about this, and <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what that is. Yeah. So you're going to have to explain that. So I was in, this, in a hardware store um, in Northern California around the Sacramento area, and I was at what we would not call a kiosk now. It was actually a table with a plastic tablecloth uh, over it. And I was selling these phones that were $3,000 for the equipment, um, and they came in a briefcase, so that's what it was. And then. Um, the service was like $100 a month, then a dollar a minute, and it didn't work very well. So that was, that was my entry into the wireless business. And then for the next 25 years, I did almost every job in wireless you can imagine. Anytime there was a new job, I would go say, I'll do that. I'll take that one. Um, and I just kind of worked my way up. And then uh, just about three years ago, I was running our wireless business, and uh, Lowell came to see me, our chairman, and said, hey, we've got uh, this challenge with our, uh, the business that uh, we think is going to be pretty important that we have um, some progress against in the next three to five years, and we'd like you to take on um, this new role, which was really about building products and services for our three core businesses at Verizon, but within 24 hours, it became, we'd like you to really stand up um, two or three businesses that can generate multi-billion dollar revenue streams. And uh, so that's kind of where I, where I landed. But it was just uh, doing lots of different things. Um, only said no to a job once, and it was just because of a personal reason, but moved all over the country and um, kind of grew up in the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've been talking today a lot about women in the C-suite, and certainly you are two of the most impressive, some of the most impressive women in the C-suite. And it's interesting because, um, Silicon Valley, the tech industry has had to face a lot of hard questions, um, especially in the last few months, about why there aren't more women. And, you know, is there a culture of sexism or corporate cultural problems? I'm not talking at the big companies necessarily, but at some of the more private, the startups. Um, why, why did you, Peggy, decide to go to Microsoft? What made you think that this would be a good environment as an engineer? And what's the ratio right now of female engineers to male engineers? And how do you sort of look to boost that? So the reason I chose to go to Microsoft was it was about culture, to tell you the truth. Satya had been a CEO for about three or four months. And I could just see there was this fantastic change going on there, just from what I read about. Like he put 
Office onto iPhones. That was something that maybe would have never happened in the past in the old days of Microsoft. And so it piqued my interest. And then when I met him, um, you know, he talked about culture. It's very, very important to him. And there was a pivotal moment that he had um, when he read the book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. She's a Stanford psychologist. And uh, it, she talks about this thing, a growth mindset, having a growth mindset. And basically, the premise is if you have um, two people in a room, and one's a know-it-all, and one's a learn-it-all, the learn-it-all will go farther. Hmm. The one who is inquisitive, asks questions, tries to understand what the problems are, doesn't come in with the fixed answer, um, is really the one that succeeds. And that, had, that resonated with Satya. And we have now adopted that uh, as our culture at Microsoft. And it causes us to be so, it just frees your mind. You can uh, go back and say things like, oh, we, we've done that. We're not going to try that again. And then someone will say, have a growth mindset. And it resets us. <laughs> and it's, it's very much um, you know, from top to bottom, 110,000 employees, we have embraced a growth mindset. And I think you know, when you look at Silicon Valley, I think um, you know, there, there's, there's not a lot of women, in part because there's not a lot of women engineers, and it's a tech-based you know, area. Folk tech focused area. Um, do we need more women engineers? Absolutely. They could fill the gap that we have. We need engineers desperately, and women are underrepresented in engineering. I think we have to do a better job of, of uh, showing young women what they can do with that engineering degree. That was what was missing with me until I got to university and then I learned. But no one drew that line about, you know, like today with the advance of analytics and big data, young engineers can maybe be part of solving diseases or climate change issues. Mm -hmm. But if you don't draw that line for them, they think, well, I don't want to do that because I, I think engineering's for guys. Is there another part of it, though, I wonder? Um, can it be a boys' club? How do you counter that? And that's some of what you've heard over the last few months. People have come out very bravely and said um, there's a culture of sexism. So how have you found that in your experience? And how do you deal with that situation if you have come across it? Well, for most of my life, I was the only woman in the room ever. <laughs> there was just no other women engineers. And I remember one day years ago at Qualcomm walking by a room, and there was a bunch of women in there. And I was like, what is that? What is going on in there? <laughs> Let me in. Women, <laughs> yeah. And it was, um, it was our HR department, which was largely women. And it, it was just a meeting of our HR representatives. <laughs> but I was fascinated by a room of women. I'd never seen that before. Um, but I think what we can do is shine a light on it. And that's what's happening. People are reporting their numbers. They're talking about um, the, the advances. And it's slow, but it's steady. And I'm super optimistic. We just need engineering talent so desperately. Yeah. And I think we're finally showing young women that, and, and young men, this is a great field. You will be employed. And um, this, I think, putting a big flashlight on those things is going to be helpful. Interesting. Uh, now, Marnie, I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to read a headline. Um, and it's such a stellar headline. I just had to bring it here. Um, it comes from Recode. And if you're not familiar, this is sort of the authority on tech news and scoops. Uh, the headline is, Rising Star Marnie Walden is the woman behind Ryzen's efforts to buy Yahoo. And it was just you know, talking about how, what a critical part you have been. It's more than Yahoo, but um, there's another headline, Meet the woman who is trying to make Ryzen more than just a dumb pipe. I'm sorry, <laughs> not to, but you know, this is, we're in such disruptive industries right now. And Verizon has done such an interesting job in the acquisition of AOL and Yahoo and going into content and media. Tell us a little bit about that push, um, what that felt like, and if it was it easy, was it difficult? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I had grown up in the business where I had done, even though I wasn't an engineer, I managed engineering teams, and I had done almost every role that there was in wireless. And so when I got put into this role, um, what was really, really challenging, but also exciting, is it didn't exist before. So there was no role model that you could say, okay, I'm going to do it kind of like that, or you'd had a bad role model, you'd say, I'll never do it like that. Um, it was white space, and so I had to assemble a team that could work in that white space, and it was really interesting. There's a, um, someone who worked for me um, for many, many years, and I thought they were just brilliant, I thought they are going to be perfect for this team. And within a week, they were coming into my office saying, like, okay, what meetings am I supposed to go to? And like, you know, who do I need to be talking to? And I was like, 
you have no meetings, you have no team. This, we've, we've got to just figure this out. And so, um, and it wasn't a business that Verizon was in either. So we um, had to think about how do we take assets that Verizon has and scale those into meaningful things and you know, what kind of things do we need to buy and what kind of things do we need to partner with. Um, so that was really the biggest challenge is going into a job that no one had ever done and having a team come in where you have to start from scratch and learn how to work in that space. Um, you know, I think the good news is I had tremendous amount of support from the board and from our chairman um, because it was one of the questions I asked is how long do I ha you know how long do I have to do this because if the answer was like in typical Verizon fashion I need it by next quarter then I knew I wasn't going to be set up for success so I spent a lot of time talking to our board about um, you know the kind of runway um, that that we would you know, need and that we'd have to have. And so um, that was helpful to have that support. But that was a really important conversation because if I wouldn't have had that um, in typical big company results focused fashion, um, it, would have, it would have been challenging for sure. I feel like you're being a little bit modest. How come Rico t says that you are the woman behind the acquisition? I mean, it, it, how did you see this sort of innovation coming? How did you see things changing and that it was no longer enough to just deliver the bits and bytes? but you had to create content if you wanted to stay relevant. Yeah, I mean, it started with really just looking at all of Verizon's assets, and I'll even step back before the Yahoo acquisition, really with the AOL acquisition. One of the things that Verizon has, as does many companies, Microsoft one of the biggest, is we had very rich data. Um, and But we had no way to really monetize that in a responsible way, and so we started looking around at who we could partner with, um, for ad tech capabilities and data science and you know, machine learning and all, all of those kinds of things that you hear about today. Um, and that led to AOL. And, and frankly, I'd love to be able to say, you know, hey, I had this vision that it was going to be AOL and then it was going to be Yahoo <laughs> and then it was going to be these other things. Um, I kind of got into that as we were going. But once I um, did the AOL transaction, it became very clear this, is that it, this was a space that we could be good at, but we were going to need to do some other things to really scale it. And so, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with our board talking about what those steps were and what we would need to go buy and, you know, the, all of the, you know, money that we need to invest and, uh, you know, convince them that that was a good thing. And for Verizon, you know, as many of the operators, um, those businesses are incredibly capital intense. You know, we spend on average $17 billion, uh, every single year to uh, keep our networks running. And so, one of the things that I was very focused on is how do I leverage the assets but get into businesses that can provide things that will ride on our, our what we believe is the best network in the world, um, but be on the top and participate in that space. So that's where I was focused and focused in places that didn't have that same capital intensity that our core businesses do, which is um, was important for us. I think that's incredible. Uh, insight. When you look at it now, it may seem obvious, but I think at the time it was quite amazing. And Peg, I want to turn that question to you as well. In terms of innovation, you were saying that you know you saw that Satya Nadella was putting windows on phones. How remarkable that was! Um, but you know, we talk a lot about these old legacy companies um, on CNBC and trying to turn this massive ship, and how difficult and how transformative and how many years that can take. Um, we call them great ships sometimes. Companies that existed before Facebook and. Google now Alphabet. Microsoft has done such an incredible job with that, going into cloud computing, Windows on the phone, and something under your tenure, LinkedIn. Tell me a little bit about how that deal came to be and you know, how you stay ahead, stay at the forefront of innovation, not just LinkedIn, but you know, artificial intelligence. So LinkedIn was definitely a team sport, and um, there, were, there were a lot of connections uh, into the company, our, you know, we, our technical teams were close, um, Satya and Jeff were close, and at, at some point it made sense to look at the next step. Um, I would say it's been fabulous to have Jeff as part of our management uh, group and his, his leadership and his perspective, which is different than folks who grew up on, on the Redmond campus. And, Satya very much values that, um, that sort of that outside in perspective and it's been super helpful not only with just the collaboration with LinkedIn and as we've integrated the company in, but it has had this halo effect on the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. Again, it's very freeing, people are bringing up new ideas, um, we're innovating, I feel like we're, our image is changing. 
Um, I didn't know you called us old grade ships. Is that what it was? That? <laughs> great ships. Great ships. Yes, okay. No, but just the old The, the old, old part wasn't in there. Okay. <laughs> we just heard that it's cool to be a grandma. Yeah, so. that's right. I guess that's okay then. When was it not cool to be a grandma? <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's always cool to be a grandma. Um, so w w one of the things that we've done just recently, sort of following on this theme of innovation, is when I first got to Microsoft, I noticed that we didn't have um, an early stage venture fund. And this was something we had had at Qualcomm. It had been very successful for us. It sort of gave us the opportunity to look under the nose of the tent of some of these very disruptive companies that one day could be um, competitive with us or maybe one day could be a partner of ours. And we were completely missing that. And I brought it up a few times, and, and it was, oh, we don't need to do that. You know, if we can invest in anybody. And while it's true, it's, there's sort of an art form to early stage investing. I think you're doing some of this now, too. It's definitely, you know, you've got to be in the flow. You've got to be plugged in uh, to the Valley and other tech centers around the world. So um, I pushed and pushed, and we, we now have launched Microsoft Ventures. And we've made about 38 investments in the last year. It's brought us back into the valley in a good way. Um, we're, we're trying to, um, to be relevant in that space again. And we're seeing now technologies at the early stage that we were missing before. So it's been super helpful. And, and the whole company's behind it. It's been a, it's been a wonderful one Microsoft uh, effort. And I'm glad you brought up some of these smaller investments. I mean, mm -hmm. we talked about the big headline ones, but like you said, um, lots of smaller investments in companies that will, you know, keep you relevant and everything. Have you, has this been a good way to attract female talent, you know, so-called acquihire? You look at a company, see a really strong uh, group of people working together. Is that an opportunity to bring uh, women into the company that may not have been there? Yeah, I, I definitely think it is. At Verizon, we run um, really two venture funds, um, about $100 million out of one. And then we have a dedicated fund, which is run by Susan Line, um, called Built by Girls. So we only fund female entrepreneurs. And um, I would say that initiative alone, um, just we've acquired some great talent. We've invested in some great um, companies. Um, but it clearly shows that we're dedicated to the space. And we have so much more to do, but it, it's a start. Um, and a lot of times with venture funding, um, we've sort of changed how we think about it. But we used to think about it as, OK, let's go invest. And it might turn into something interesting. But we did a pivot on that, because when, you when you're a you know, $130 billion company, um, if you make $5 million, it's not all that interesting to anybody. Um, they want to talk in billions. And so we've really changed venture funding um, to fund things that can either accelerate or teach us about new spaces. And so that's how we, how we think about it. And a lot of those, um, those ventures um, end up um, being full-on acquisitions. And so, um, but I'm very focused on Built by Girls. So I think that's a, a, a good start to get more female um, talent into mm -hmm. the organization. That's very cool. Um, now, I do want to touch on this. Um, Marnie does not hate kids. We've already figured this out. She has one. Peggy, you have four. Three. 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 And four dogs. And four dogs. Yes. OK. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's important we talk a little bit about that work-life balance. You are both very, very successful women. Um, what has that journey been like with kids in the equation, especially maybe for someone in the audience who wants to start a family? But, and I know what that's like, you can be scared to you know, start a family when your career is going well. Uh, what would you say to women? Yeah, so I got a late start. So I only have one. And I actually, when people ask what are some of the things you would have, would do over, I would have started a little bit earlier. And I probably would have had two, um, particularly as I left my son this morning. And he was um, being charming versus um, difficult. But um, <laughs> um, so I mean, it's hard. Whenever you get, you know, everybody gets that work-life balance question. You know, there is none. There is no work-life balance. You just have to pay attention to what's sort of the priority at the time. Sometimes it's family. And if you know, there's something going on at home um, that needs to take care, be taken care of, then that's your priority. If there's a deadline at work, you got to make that a priority. But I really try and make um, just quality time count. And, and I think having a child, what you learn pretty quickly is you waste a lot of time um, you know, taking unnecessary meetings or being on conference calls or sitting around at work doing email when you could do it someplace else. Um, so I don't, I, I don't waste time anymore because it's important that I'm home with my family when I can be home. 
Um, but that being said, I have a fantastic husband who's enabled uh, me to move 10 different times. Um, and usually when you move at Verizon, you get a call on a, on a Friday and you're supposed to be at the job on Saturday. Um, and so there's not a lot of time to think through that. So, you know, moving the household and all of that. So I've been fortunate that I've had a, a partner that could help me do that. You know, and we've hired some help when we needed to, even in the days where we probably couldn't even afford um, some of that help. Um, it's, you know, a little different now, but um, you try and make it, make it work that way. It's almost like an investment in some ways at those early stages and you have to hire help. Yeah. Do I want to have my house cleaned or my kid taken care of? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it was my house cleaned, by the way. <laughs> Go for it. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Um, Peggy, would love to hear your thoughts on Yeah, that. I would just say, drawing on what Marnie said, someone years ago told me this story, and they said you should envision your life as several glass balls. You have your partner, you have your kids, you have your health, you have your work, and you're juggling. You're juggling all of them. And you never want to drop one of them, but it's okay to set one down. And so I think, going back to what you said, it's okay to prioritize one over the other. Sometimes you just, you have to do that. And I think about when I was having my kids, pretty much right out of college. My husband and I got married. Two years later, we had our first uh, child. And I remember thinking, I've, gotta, I've just got to keep working up to the very end. And I was literally you know, in labor at work. I was in labor at work. <laughs> and, and I thought, I've just got to sign my time card. Because back then, that's what you did. You oh. signed a time card, or she didn't get paid. I thought, i got to sign this time card, and then I'm going to go to the hospital. <laughs> wow. And that's like. What was I thinking? And now, you know, I should have put the work ball down that day and just gone to the hospital. But um, it all works out. Maybe. <laughs> I think the one other thing, too, is I, I think sometimes women don't think it's okay to set boundaries with your, exactly. your boss, um, which uh, I had, a, when I first had my child, I had a very, like, he was so pro-family. He was all calling me saying, it's 5 o'clock, you have a kid, you need to get home, what are you doing here? Um, but there were other times where I didn't have that proactive boss who was doing that, and I had to say, look, I'm not going to leave on a Sunday today because it's not mission critical, or I'm not going to be on that conference call at 9 o'clock at night um, because there's something I need to do. And most of the time, in fact, I don't think I ever have gotten a negative reaction to somebody who said, wow, I didn't even think about that. Cool, go be with your family um, you know, and do those things as long as you're getting your work done. Um, you know, I think setting boundaries is important to do, and that's just got to put yourself out there and, you know, say. I like that phrase true. you just used. It's yeah. not mission critical. Yeah. It kind of puts it in perspective, yeah. right? Like you said, if you're juggling all those balls, mm -hmm. you got to decide which one to set down when. Um, okay, I know we're running lower on time, so I wanted to touch as well. We are here at the KPMG Women's Leadership Summit. also happens to be the LPGA. So we were chatting a little bit um, backstage. We have two more women that don't golf. <laughs> Um, although very sporty, as we know, um, and I just wanted to, are you, are you at a disadvantage if you don't golf? I guess that's what I'm wondering. What would you recommend to someone who maybe even doesn't have a lot of time and is juggling all these balls? Is there, are there other things that you can do? Yeah, you know, I think both of us beat in the wireless industry in the early days. It seemed like everybody golfed, and that's where deals got done out on the course. And and I didn't golf. And I remember thinking, I've just got to learn or else I'm going to miss out. Um, I mean, if I rewind, I would have done other things. But on that particular day um, in my career, I said, I'm going to need to learn how to golf or else I'm never going to be in the conversation. So then I thought, you know, I play softball pretty well. I play softball all my life. It's how different is it, right? You just, you know, it's either swing like this or swing like this. I can do it. Hey, hey, hey. So, you got some no, I, I know we have some good golfers in here, but in my mind, I, I thought, <laughs> I got this. So I remember one of the, the other telcos had a big um, tournament, and they, they asked me to play in it. I'm like, yeah, I got it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I had never played in my life. <laughs> I hit a bucket of balls and um, went out, and I put my... Um, my swing that I had envisioned in my head into practice, and I went, you know, I thought about it, okay, I'm gonna just swing, first tee, everybody's watching, right? And I don't know how this happened, but I swing the, the ball like straight down the middle as far as you could see. I'm like, I don't know what just happened. Never <laughs> happened again the rest of the day. Yeah. Never happened again. But you didn't need it I've to, never, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was all, right? Check that box. But it was, I, I'm just not very good at it. I've tried it a few times. I think probably I should, you know, actually be taught 
<laughs> you still think today that you, it is something that you'd like to do? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I, it, I love being outdoors. I mean, how, what better than to yep. go out and play? And I, I definitely will get back to that. Okay, great. Yeah, early on, Peggy and I were talking this in back. Peggy was at Qualcomm and I was at Verizon, so we did a lot of work together. But I think um, everybody everybody golfed. And I think mm -hmm. it was less about, um, you know, not going. I, I don't really golf. I can golf and a little bit, maybe worse than Peggy, for sure. But, <laughs> I don't know. It's um, pretty bad. But you, you wouldn't even get invited. Like, they didn't yeah, really invite you to go. And so I think that indefinitely, those, you know, deals happen on golf courses, in men's rooms, in, like, all kinds of places that sometimes women weren't invited. And so I think that was probably the bigger issue. I think today most of, you don't see a lot of, you know, golf outings, I think, at least, you know, sort of during the work days. There's fewer that they used to be. And it's just because of time, I think. You know, people have, you know, things they're juggling and, um, a lot of, in, in the tech industry, a lot of younger people who are juggling families and stuff, so I, I don't see that as much. But um, certainly if you didn't participate in those, you were missing out. I think it's the same thing that's happening just with en women engineers, um, with where most of the engineers come in late at night and code, and so those women who are engineers who are starting families get left out of, of those. And again, it's when people are gathered together that things start to happen, and if you're not there, you miss out. Right, right. Right. So maybe it's looking for those opportunities, like the baseball games yeah. and hoping that you hit one out yeah. of the park for your yeah. first one. Or running. I ask people to run now and <laughs> just you know, try to get yeah. them where they're totally breathless, they can't breathe, and then go in for some negotiating point. That's a now good, you know. good tactic. <laughs> we learned something about <laughs> yeah. your negotiating tactics. Exactly. We do have you know, a minute left, so I would love to ask you one more question. Biggest risk, I'm, I'm curious, biggest risk that you think you've taken in your career or life? Peggy, we'll, we can start oh, with you. For I, me, I, no, I didn't give you much time. Yeah, just jumping from Qualcomm. Qualcomm. I loved Qualcomm. I grew up there. San Diego, right? It was great. My family was all there. And it's a rainy Seattle. <laughs> to, yeah, to jump and pick up and move. It was, it was big. I, I struggled with that quite a while, but never looked back, and it's been wonderful. Yeah, I would say it's the job I'm in right now because I had a pretty good gig going on in wireless, and not that I got you know, had a choice really, because when you start to take those jobs, it, they don't say, hey, would you, would you not, you know, that's not how it works out. It's like, hey, we need you to come do this and you, you go do it. But um, it was uncharted territory. And by the way, only the first half of the story is written. The, you know, outcome Very is, much is so. we yeah. don't have the end of the story. So um, I think the role I'm in now is really risky, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I said to our, our board, um, because they knew I was sort of, you know, Reluctant maybe is not the right word, but when the job was first introduced, I thought, gosh, I'm running the wireless business. I was born to do it. I've done all the jobs. I'm super comfortable. Um, and now I was talking to one of our board members, and she said, you know, how do you feel now? And I said, I, I just I can't imagine not having this job. If I didn't have this job, I'd be so envious of who had it. Right. Um, and I am super uncomfortable, but that's when you, you know, you all know it. it's when you feel yourself growing in amazing ways and learning new things. So. Mm -hmm.